This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We are on to week number four in the NFL, and week number four has some pretty fun matchups on tap, specifically not the Broncos, Bears, sorry, Ryan, not the Panthers and Vikings, but we've got the Bills and the Dolphins just around the corner, and I think it's time to start talking about Dolphins' futures, start talking about their ceiling, what they could possibly do in that department as a kind of... I guess, appetizer for that game coming this weekend. We're going to do that today. Talk about the dolphin ceiling. Talk about stock up, stock down. Coming off of week three, then I'll get my first look at week number four as well, all later on today. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here as I am every Tuesday by Ryan Williams. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Ryan, we are on to week number four. How are you doing today? Oh, we're doing we're doing all right, Jim. We're doing fantastic. We're on to week four. We're almost a quarter of the way through the season. Oof. Just insane to think about. Uh, I got a I got an article that I need to be working on here, Jim, <laughs> as we think about futures the quarter of the way through. But uh, but no, man, this is this is fun. I think there are great matchups that are on tap. For- um, we're going to talk about that futures market and kind of see what, what's happening there. And I think, you know, what I've been saying so far this year is, you know, if he can, you know, grind through and, and, and make it, you know, uh, he missed a couple of games. Yeah, and that's why, you know, the Bengals could be okay and watch out. And we saw that kind of come to fruition last night, just how much this team can rally around, you know, their starting quarterback and make, life a little bit easier for him uh, to be able to game manage, quote unquote, uh, as they look to kind of right the ship after uh, starting 0-2. Yeah, the Bengals, when we talked yesterday morning, markets kind of implied Burrow would not play, but he did wind up going. Uh, they didn't cover the closing spreads. It was three, so they pushed on that, but did get the win. I'm showing money or value on the the Bengals money line this week against Tennessee. That's a a situation where they encourage you to throw against them. That might be kind of tough. Not sure if I'll actually pull the trigger on that. That is not in the discussion later on for my first look at week number four. But uh, it was (laughs) he did look better as the game went along, at least. So I feel like that was somewhat encouraging. Like they won the game, Ryan, even though T Higgins had for the second time this year, like a nightmare, nightmare performance. Yeah, he and I know he left the game, I believe came back into the game uh, to kind of finish that out there. Um, <laughs> it was just, there were actually conversations about, you know, both Jamar's contract and T's contract being up and who they're going to pay. Um, and that is like a fireball offense if you select T Higgins over Jamar Chase and like no no offense whatsoever to uh, Jamar or to T Higgins, but like we saw last night that Jamar Chase is just, you know, uh, there's a reason why he's argued uh, to be one of the best receivers in the league um, because of what he's able to do uh, with his, you know, former quarterback there at the home when they were in college. So uh, yeah, I think those, those debates could be put to rest. Absolutely. And uh, Jamar Chase, fantastic. Um, Didn't get the touchdown for you last night, but he did everything but that. So uh, good showing by Chase, despite the no touchdown for him last night. We're going to dive into the futures market, talking about the Dolphins, you know, what their true potential is relative to the rest of the AFC, especially with some teams struggling the AFC right now. And then take a look at other futures Ryan likes before week three, before war week four. And I'll take a look at the opening spreads, totals and money lines at FanDuel Sportsbook. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the covering the spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast you can also find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and on FanDuel TV plus to get FanDuel TV plus go to FanDuel.com slash watch or download the FanDuel TV plus app on Amazon Fire Apple TV or Roku devices log into your FanDuel account to watch uh, up at Adams live you can also 
Check out covering the spread, the solo shot with Tom Vecchio for the rest of this week, uh, and then also the Heat Check NFL podcast with myself and Brandon Gadula every Monday and Thursday, breaking down NFL DFS all over on FanDuel TV+. Plus. Let's kick things off here, Ryan, by talking about the Miami Dolphins because they lit it up in week three, posting a 70-burger against the Broncos, and I think people broadly give them a lot of respect because they're going on the road, facing Buffalo this week, just two and a half point dogs in a very tough spot, but they're still not you know, among the favorites to win the Super Bowl right now. As we pull up the Super Bowl odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook, Miami sitting currently down at 10 to 1, and they are plus 550 to win the AFC. So, Ryan, do they tempt you in those markets, or do the concerns around the fragility of this offense, kind of relying on two or three guys, does that worry you enough where you're okay missing out on the Dolphins in those higher upside markets? Yeah, I I think at this point I'm okay, Jim, uh, only because, and, you know, hate to bring it back to last year, but we did see this not 70 to 20 uh, in week three, but we did see them start off hot last year again. Um, And we know how much uh, rides on the health uh, of Tua um, with the concussions and, you know, that lingers out for me is like how much he dealt with last year. And if for some reason, like that comes to fruition again this year, you know, the, 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 right now, if you had any futures on the Miami dolphins um, at the start of the season, like you are holding on to um you know the 10 to 1 is, is interesting um the 5 to 1 in the AFC it, you know it just it, it's too it, it it's too heavy for me right now at, just to buy into i think the buffalo bills matchup this week is is able to handle business in that game which i'm not even sure if it's on the uh are they home or away for that game they're it's actually in on buffalo. the road they're visiting buffalo so, yeah. Yeah, yeah in buffalo so that's a that's one that I definitely want to look into. They are just such a fun team. You love the defense uh, on that side. They're doing this without Jalen Ramsey. Uh, you see Tua and Jalen chumming it up on the sidelines uh, against Denver. Oh, uh, you know it's going to be one of those things, like you said at the beginning, Jim. I, I'm just, I'm just going to have to eat crow and and live with it if the Dolphins are you know better than the Chiefs. The Bengals, if they're fully healthy, the Buffalo Bills, if they're fully healthy, um, and uh, and others like we Bengals and Ravens can make some noise as well too, who have mm-hmm. been there before. Um, it does get concerning to me when we talk about them being in you know AFC divisional, AFC championship, uh, in their first time being there. But they do have playmakers across the board. Waddle coming back healthy um, is going to be huge for them. And you know, I I don't know that the backfield goes out and scores seven or eight touchdowns, whatever the heck they put up uh, this this weekend every time. But uh, it's it's been incredible. To, to see yeah I think that the concern there is valid uh just because again it's kind of like the Rams when they made their run to Super Bowl like they were dependent on like you know a couple pieces it wasn't the deepest roster and I think the Dolphins are kind of similar and the Rams did that so that's possible for the Dolphins but like you know it's it's tough and for sure and I think the other reason you can justify not buying in right now is that you expect the Chiefs offense to figure things out long term. They did it in a way on Sunday against uh, the Bears. I'd expect the Bengals as Joe Burrow's calf injury gets better to improve. The Bills have already shown that they're kind of over their week one rust, stuff like that. So I think it's a combination of concerns around injuries, along with the fact that we expect these other AFC powerhouses to trend up as the year goes along. Let's take a look back at week number three, Ryan, and talk about teams that got the biggest boost for you following week three. When you look at and try to, you know, sort out your power rankings, the way you view teams across the league, which teams shifted your perception of them most with what they did in week three? Yeah, uh, I got to talk about the Indianapolis Colts. We've talked about this AFC South division kind of being, you know, one that, uh, might be wide open if Jacksonville can't get it together. And yet again, Jacksonville is showing that they they can't get it together. And I'm not losing all hope in them. But, you know, they're doing this with the backup quarterback. There's a reason why they went out and signed Gardner Minshew um, to kind of, you know, take 
you you love when teams put themselves in a position where, hey, if our starter isn't working out, like we have a, a backup plan. And not to say that Anthony Richardson was always going to be the guy who was their number one to lead him, but like Garner has played in some, you know, played in some big enough games where, you know, we thought, yeah, if they if they want to trot this guy out or whatever, they could be competing. And this is without Jonathan Taylor. Um, this is without some other pieces who haven't been fully, fully aligned and healthy. But when you're looking at their odds to win the AFC South, they're at plus 280, third highest favored odds um behind tennessee and jacksonville like tennessee we'll talk about them in stock down uh jaguars as well that believe they have two london games in a row if i'm not mistaken they have a little uh, across the pond uh <laughs> time for for them but uh yeah the colts you know just the way that they were able to kind of handle that game against the Ravens, who we've both been kind of high on uh, at the start of this year, that definitely showed me uh, a lot of promise for them going forward if they can get some of these pieces back and, and aligned. I actually want to stick in the same division and talk about the Houston Texans because that game against the Jags, I think you could view it as stock down for the Jags, and that's fair because they had some really brutal drops. They haven't executed the way you'd expect them to. But also Houston won that game by a pretty wide margin. Obviously, the kickoff return touchdowns fluky. You don't, you don't factor that in. But even beyond that, that's still like a 13 or so point win for them. That was that Laramie Tunsil. That was with no Jalen Petrie. That was with no Derek Stingley. And those are three of their key pieces. But CJ Stroud's kind of just a dude, I think. And so they're plus 750. Now, they do have a, a yeah. couple losses already. They uh, lost to the Ravens, obviously, in week one, lost to the, the Colts in week two. So that's a big factor for sure. And that could justify the Colts at plus 280, given where they're at right now. But I also, I don't think I'd want to, like, bet the Texans to win the division. I think the gap is pretty big, like, bigger than it should be at plus 750. The, te the Texans' uh, win total is over 5.5, minus 162. I kind of wish I could get an alt over on them. Um, I know they're, they're, again, one and two so far. They lost a pretty winnable game in week two uh, with the Colts game. But I do feel like the Texans are a bit undervalued right now broadly. I'm going to bet them this week, which we'll talk about later on as well. Uh, but I think the Texans are a bit undervalued. So honestly, Ryan, the AFC yeah. South is a fascinating division. Now, you mentioned the, the Jags and the Titans coming up short. I feel like it probably would make sense to, to lump them in with the stock down for week three as well. Yeah, Jacksonville, they still have enough to right the ship, I feel yeah. like. And, you know, I, I, this is where they're going to need to dig deep uh, in these London games as I'm looking at their uh, schedule here. And going against Atlanta, then going against Buffalo. I mean, that that's really tough. This Atlanta game is dare I say a must win as they're yeah. looking at one in three, if they lose that game, then going into Buffalo, like that could be one in five that's danger zone. Um, but you know, you're looking, uh, they have a week nine bye, and then after that bye, it does get a little bit dicey with two games against San Fran and Cincinnati, albeit both of those games are at home, but then you're looking at, you know, a couple of their divisional matchups. They do also have to play Baltimore um, and they have kind of a cupcake schedule to, to end, but yeah, you would have loved to see them, you know, really much get to the week nine by with their only two losses being to Kansas city and Buffalo. So that mm -hmm. used to one kind of put them at a little bit of a disadvantage there. I just expect a little bit more than them from them and the Tennessee Titans, like, Jim, over the summer, I kind of talked about this team potentially being like having the worst record uh, in, in yeah. football. And, you know, the concerns there for me were that I just really didn't feel like they addressed the, you know, uh, quarterback position enough. Like we, we weren't getting much talk about Will Levis kind of taking over at any point. Like Ryan Tannehill has showed us that he's just kind of been on the decline. And this offense really has been on the decline since they moved away from AJ Brown. Um, Derrick Henry, you know, he's hitting that 30 plateau, right? And yeah. so you're starting to see even Tajay Spears, uh, the rookie running back, out snap him. And he just doesn't have the similar juice um, as we're used to seeing. And rightfully so. He's been you know, pretty much putting this team on his back like a Jansport backpack uh, for <laughs> the past five years. Uh, but yeah, I think they're in they're in real big trouble. Like we're looking at their over under a seven and a half wins. Like I don't see any merit on how you can uh, take that right now, even with it being at minus one ten. So um, yeah, they're they're definitely stocked down for me. Yeah, I'd agree with that too. And I think that it's a combination of things where. 
they didn't have their best offense lineman this past week. So losing big to the Browns, kind of excusable. But that also means that their best offensive lineman is a rookie who had never right. played a snap in the NFL. He's played one game, and he's probably their best offensive lineman. That game, when they got down, Henry was not a factor. And Tannehill looked a lot, a lot like he did in week one, where – just seemed like there wasn't a lot of juice left in the tank there. DeAndre Hopkins is like a, a obviously a very good player, but can he revive a passing offense that lacks juice like that? I don't know. You know, um, I don't want to count him out by any means, but I'm skeptical in general. So it's tough there. That's part of why I have some interest in checking out the Texans. If I could get, I would like an alt win over, uh, you know, over six and a half or something like that. Um, I think that would be int- int- interesting for them because they've not played the Titans as of yet. And I think that this passing offense can shred that passing defense. So I agree. I think the, the Titans and the Jags definitely belong in the stock down bucket. Any other stock downs or stock ups for week three for you, Ryan? Yeah, I'm just looking here very quickly. Uh, I mean, Stock up, and I'm just going to keep riding this wave, even though they only won the game by three last night. But, you know, if the Bengals, if Joe Burrow is just able to be healthy and be out there and like this is probably, you know, not the not the worst case scenario, the worst game that he could have possibly be in. But we we knew that Rams defense was going to be coming for him. And, you know, the offensive line did their best to to keep him upright. And so it's just going to be more days of getting healthy. You're looking at their over under win total right now being at nine and a half. And that seems about fair and right. Um, Plus 128 if you think they're going to win 10 win 10 get to 10 wins and that's pretty much what you think they'll need like going against Baltimore there. So that seems favorable even for them to make the playoffs right now, Jim is plus 100 on the FanDuel mm-hmm. sports book. And I absolutely love that number um, because they avoided that dreaded, you know, Owen three hole. And right. we talk about stock down. I'm not willing to put them there just yet because of the division they play in. The NFC North is the worst division in football. Like I don't think it can be argued at all. Um, and the green Bay Packers might end up running away with this with uh, Uh, with Jordan Love yet to be determined but you know the Vikings they have been in one score games all of their losses have been by less than seven points I talked about them last week of kind of having some merit if you if you chose to you know bet on this team uh you're looking at six and a half wins uh not very promising there even with the minus 134 number but I believe they're plus money to make the playoffs as well too um and again with all these teams making the playoffs and and why i say this jim is that they have not played a divisional opponent yet they are going to you know have have that start to come to fruition soon all of these you know games have been out of the out of the division and so and so when you're looking at it like they do have a, you know a couple games left where it's like man you know Kansas City Chiefs and a couple other playoff teams that look like a gauntlet but you know you get in the Packers twice you're getting uh the Bears twice you're going to play the Lions twice uh and if you can win these divisional games then you all of a sudden like even with your out of out of division out of conference if those are losses, like you could still make some headway um, against this, uh, against the, against the fold there. Um, again, you know, the Packers, they still got, you're talking about the same opponents. They're still going to have to play the chiefs and some of these other tougher matchups. I believe San Fran's on the schedule for these guys. So um, I'm, I'm not willing to stay one way or the other, but it definitely is concerning that they have an 0 and three uh, start to the season. Yeah, and I think that the concern there would be, do they tear things down if they if they really struggle? Right. Now, we don't see that often in the NFL midseason because trades don't happen very much. Uh, and who has the cap space to take on Kirk Cousins, which would be like the quote-unquote tear-it-down move. They right. have no viable backup they want to you know take get a look at so i think that that helps like it's not a tennessee situation where you've got levis and willis sitting behind Tannehill. like jaron hall uh nick mullen's probably not going to be the guys for the vikings long term so i think that does help in that regard uh the lions taking on the packers on thursday night i think that game is pretty fun probably gonna bet the lions money line because i know myself um (laughs) but i think that uh yeah, it's it's grim for the Vikings, so I get why there'd be some concern there. Any final futures, Ryan? You want to plug in before week number four? Yeah, uh, let's go over the rushing props, and this is one that I was going to bring up 
uh, last week before we kind of ran out of time. But, you know, with Nick Chubb, with the Nick Chubb injury, yeah. I thought that just opened the door up for so many variable things to kind of happen in this market here. Um, the one that's kind of interesting, even at his yards prop, uh, which is 20 to one. But uh, if I scroll down here, rushing touchdowns, Kenneth Walker comes in at 13 to one mm -hmm. and he's, you know, probably second or third uh, last I checked. Yeah, uh, he's actually tied for third with uh, with uh, Kyron Williams now for red zone touches um, and really been able to convert there. And we know how much Seattle put stock into giving their running backs opportunities when they get into the 20 and closer uh, to pay dirt. So I think that he has some merit there um, to kind of pay that off. You know, Tony Pollard is interesting. He leads all running backs with 24 attempts inside the red zone. Um, only converting for two touchdowns, which is concerning. And the Dallas offense right now, like at deck is very concerning. I wasn't willing to put them in stock down mode, uh, but that's just definitely something I want to monitor because um, they, they might need to lean on Tony Pollard a little bit more. So both right. of these guys seem reasonable. You know, Raheem Mostert there being at 11 to one, this guy has uh, five touchdowns right now and only eight carries inside the red zone he's doing most of his scoring uh and damage outside but I, you know i do think it's an interesting market one that i want to keep an eye on um a, as well as we get uh through the season i like the pow the power shout for both markets actually he's 13 to 1 to lead in rushing touchdowns and he is 7 to 1 i believe for rushing yardage if i scroll up yeah 7 to 1 to lead in rushing yardage first three games he had 14 carries in that giants blowout he had 25 and then 23 Red zone usage, a 40% red zone share. So percentage of team carries or targets inside the red zone, 40% week one, 48% week two, 45% week three. So I think Pollard is actually in play for both of those, especially because we saw Elijah Mitchell get more involved in week number three to give Christian McCaffrey a bit of a breather. So McCaffrey plus 260, maybe that could be a little bit shaky there as well. B. John Robinson gets spelled for Tyler Algier. So I think that Pollard, specifically in the rushing yardage market, is pretty intriguing. Touchdown market 13 to 1. I'm also interested in that. Jalen Hurts uh, plus 950, thanks to the uh, the sneaks. Um, so <laughs> that's right. uh, interesting as well. But I think that the Pollard shout, Ryan, is, is a good one and one that I'm on board with. Yeah, and even when you're looking at both of those guys with with Pollard and and Walker there, when you're looking at their touches, like you know, because I think if there was some concern there that you know Rico Rico Duado and uh, and Deuce Vaughn are going to be getting some work, but Duado he's only got 21 touches compared to Pollard's 74. Kenneth Walker has 55 compared to Charbonnet's 19. Mm -hmm. um, so both of those guys are kind of separating themselves from the rest of the backfield. And that's definitely something that we you know want to take advantage of. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, Dowdle seems like it's more just kind of giving a spell every now and then. Yeah. Um, he's gotten high profile spells because that was kind of like an island game effectively this past week where there were no other games on. Uh, and of course, we saw him Sunday night against the in that Giants game. So I think his role is a bit overstated because he's been up in key moments like powered last week, 87 percent snap rate. So. He's definitely still heavily involved in that offense. All righty. That is Ryan Williams. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W Ryan. A pleasure having you on here once again for today and this week. Have a good rest of your week. We'll talk to you once again next Monday for just a single Monday Night football game next week. Just the single. Yep. We're back to we're back to single. We're back to potentially having Manning cast on uh, as, as well, too. So I guess all the all is right in the world. But yeah, Jim, have a great rest of the week. Good luck, everybody. We'll talk soon. All righty. Thank you, Ryan. That is Ryan Williams. Again, check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. He mentioned uh, the writing piece. That'll be up on FanDuel.com slash research is where you can find Ryan's writing work throughout the season. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, totals, and more. So visit FanDuel.com to kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL, must be 21 plus and present in select states. 
FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1 800 next step or text next step to 53342 in Arizona 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut 1-800-9 with it in Indiana 1-800-522-4700 visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts and call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and y in New York. Let's take a look now where my models are showing value across week number four at FanDuel Sportsbook. We'll start things off with one I alluded to earlier on. That is the Texans plus three, which is minus 104 at FanDuel Sportsbook as they take on the Pittsburgh Steelers. And to me, I have value on both the money line and the spread in this game. Um, the money line for the Texans right now is plus 136. I show value there as well, but paying minus 104 to get a push on three and a win on two or one, I think that's pretty enticing. So I'm okay taking the three here. My model does make the Steelers favorites here by 0.76 points. So I'd expect this to be a pretty tight game. We know the Steelers defense is very, very tough. And the prospect of having TJ Watts, Minka Fitzpatrick, facing an offense that this past week was starting only one of its projected starting five offensive linemen. That's pretty daunting, but the Texans offense has still been efficient through the air, and they've had plus marks in both early down passing efficiency and late down success rate, and that's been without those starting offensive linemen. Laramie Tunsil played week one, but I'd expect him to be back this week, and that'd be a big boost for Houston again in this tough matchup uh, with, uh, with TJ Watt. They did a decent job of keeping the Jags in check defensively. Uh, despite that secondary being banged up, they had no Derek Stingley there, no Jim Petrie. I'm not sure if Petrie will be back. That's a lung issue, which is kind of concerning. And Stingley, I think, will sit because uh, he has a hamstring injury that popped up midweek. So secondary is banged up. Offense is banged up. But the Texans are playing well despite that. So to me, getting three at home for a team that has looked pretty frisky thus far Kind of hard to turn down. So although I thought entering this year, I'd be high in the Steelers quite a bit. This is the second straight week I've bet against them. Did not go well this past week against the Raiders, but I'm willing to go back again with the Texans in week four and taking them plus four in this time around. Second one for me will be a money line and a pretty high profile matchup in the AFC North. That is the Baltimore Ravens taking on the Cleveland Browns. And right now the Ravens money line is plus 118 at FanDuel Sportsbook. I will take that spread here is two and a half. Thus, uh, while I'm going towards the money line instead. And it's tough to bet against Cleveland's defense. They've been insane so far. They rank second in early down passing efficiency. Uh, they rank, I think, fourth in early down rushing efficiency. And then they're second, I believe, in a late down success rate as well. So they've been phenomenal across the board uh, when you look at what their defense has done so far. And I don't think that's fluky based on their personnel, based on Jim Schwartz. I think that will keep up. But even accounting for that and accounting for the injuries that Baltimore has, I still make this uh, a toss up with the Browns saver by 0.38. And again, getting plus 118 when that's the case is enough where I'm willing to uh, take the bait and go with the Ravens here. Lamar Jackson has played decent. He's kept the offense chugging along well enough with no Tyler Linderbaum, Linderbaum and Ronnie Stanley the past two weeks. It hasn't been perfect by any means because they did, you know, lose obviously to the Colts, but it was a lot of mistakes. Uh, they had a, a key drop in that game. Uh, they had a missed uh, pass interference call in Zay Flowers. If they can cut out those crucial mistakes, as Kenyon Drake had a lot at a fumble on a long run too. I think that the offense should have some positive regression going forward, especially if we get some of those key pieces who have been out back in the game on the opposing side, the Browns offense did look really good. Uh, first game without Nick Chubb, but that was against the Titans. The Titans 
they've bled production to passing games so far. They did it earn early downs last year too. That's translating to late downs this year thus far. Baltimore has excelled um, as far as is excelled defensively, even with the injuries they've had. So if every Ravens player who sat last week winds up sitting again this week, it's very possible to say just poorly. But if we assume at least some of those guys come back, they didn't practice, which is concerning, but uh, I think we could get some of them back potentially. I think that this will wind up being undervalued. So the Ravens plus 118 taking on the Browns, other money line or the, the first money line for me in week number four. Second money line is on Monday night football. The Seahawks taking on the Giants. Right now, Seattle is plus 110. I show value here, even if I assume that Saquon Barkley plays for the Giants and is fully healthy. Similar to Nick Chubb, Saquon Barkley is a guy who does move the needle for me, at least in my model, because he impacts passing efficiency a pretty good amount. If we downgrade Barkley even a tiny bit, this would be even a bigger value uh, for me right now. My model does make Seattle favored here by 0.49 points, so getting plus money on the money line, pretty attractive. Seattle's offense has been very good on early downs, both passing and rushing. They just need to shore things up on third and fourth down. The Giants have had one of the worst passing offenses in the league on early downs. Seattle's rush defense seems to be better than it was last year. I'm questioning that because they have not faced the stiffest competition in that market. Uh, they face the Rams. They face the Panthers. They face the Lions with David Montgomery getting banged up in that game. So maybe they're improved. I, I can't tell. Even when I just adjust for opponents, they've still been good, but still a bit early to call the too early to tell there. But, it, you know, maybe they're better able to handle Saquon should he be able to suit up because he is kind of a cyborg in that regard. So, I'm fine being high on Seattle in this spot. I think plus 110 is pretty forgiving. So uh, spreads and money lines this week. I like the Texans plus three. Ravens uh, plus 118 in the money line and the Seahawks money line at plus 110. Couple of totals I like, and it's for both the toilet bowl games. The two teams, uh, the two games where both teams are 0-3 thus far. I like the under in both those, which feels pretty good betting against those particular offenses. Let's start things off here by talking about the Vikings and the Panthers. That total right now is 45 and a half under is minus 110. And that's where I want to go. Wind forecast here is at nine miles per hour. If we were to assume that holds, I have the total here at 42.1. So a good chunk below where it's at right now. If I put the, the wind at zero, it does still show value in the under. So some wiggle room there in case the wind speed should come down. These two teams operate at a decent pace. That's kind of the one counterpoint to Liking and under here, uh, I guess you could all say the defenses. They're not good either, but offenses are not perfect. Uh, you get a win on 45 and a half at 44 and 45. I think that's attractive enough for me to plug this bet in. Now, Panthers and Vikings, they did put up points this past week, 24 for the Vikings, and I think like 27 or so for the Panthers. Maybe if Andy Dalton plays, they can push the ball once again. It's the Adam Thielen revenge game, but... I just feel like there are enough factors at play here. We should take the under at 45 and a half. Second one is the Bears and Broncos. As mentioned, that total right now is 46. And obviously, if you're taking the under here, which I am, you're betting against two of the arguably the two worst defenses in football so far this year. But the offenses are kind of bad, too. And that does matter at a certain point. It's possible the Broncos are due for some positive regression uh, because I don't think Russell Wilson is as bad as it might seem based on some of the numbers so far. He also might be, it could be, I don't know. I don't want to put all the blame on him, but the offense has not been good thus far. The Bears obviously have not been good offensively. And even if we assume some positive regression for the Broncos, that's not enough to bridge the gap between my where my model is at and the total here. I've got a 43 and a half on my end. That's with projected wind speed of five miles per hour. Even if the winds were to decrease, I should still show value here. So you could view it as betting against the uh, betting an under on the two worst defenses in football. But I choose to view it the positive where, where I'm betting an under on two pretty rough offenses. So to me, unders for the Bears, Broncos and Vikings, Panthers games, the way to go if you're going to bet those two toilet bowl games because... I do show value there. So to recap NFL for this week, under for Bears Broncos at 46 minus 110, under for Vikings Panthers 45 and a half at minus 110, 
Uh, Seattle money line plus 110, Ravens money line plus 118, and the Texans plus three at minus 104. Before we close up shop for today, do you got to go back through recommendations from the show last week? And uh, let's start things off with Dr. Ed Fang. Uh, we had him here on Wednesday and Thursday to talk college football in the NFL. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. Check him out at thepowerrank.com. And Ed, 2 0 this past week. For college, Ed had Kansas minus eight and a half against BYU. Kansas closed as a nine point favorite here. They were down 17-14 at halftime, but Kansas shredded in the second half. They won 38-27 to cover the 8.5 and and get a win for Ed there. On the NFL side of things, Ed liked Cleveland minus 3 at Tennessee. That got to 3.5, I believe, pretty shortly after we recorded, but didn't matter where he got it because Cleveland romped. They won 27-3, never in doubt there. So good week for Ed. He's back with us once again tomorrow talking college football Week number five. Our props guest on Friday was JJ Zacharyson. Check him out on Twitter at late round QB and find his work at late round.com. JJ had Nico Collins over 40 or 50 and a half receiving yards at minus 130, but it was Tank Dell who dominated that game. He had 145 yards. Being on the Texans passing game was good, just you know, wasn't the right guy. Collins, three targets. Uh, he went under there. Other yardage bet was Kendrick Bourne under 35 and a half receiving yards. Mac Jones completed just 15 passes in this game, but Bourne had four of those and he hit the over uh, 46 yards for um, Bourne there. So he did go over that number touchdown bets for Travis Etienne at minus 110 and a long shot on Donovan Peoples Jones at plus 480 tank Bigsby school goal uh, stole a goal line touchdown from Etienne. So that one missed uh, uh, Peoples Jones turned four targets into 49 yards, but no touchdowns for him. So, we were due for some regression there based on how good of a start JJ had had. All happened to come in one week. He'll be back with us once again Friday to preview week number four. We had Ryan on yesterday to talk about the two Monday night games. He had the Eagles minus four and a half, obviously a coast to a victory there. Total did not hit. He liked over 45, finished at 36 there. He did hit the total in the second game, though. That was Bengals Rams. He liked under 43 and a half at minus 110. Now, when we talked... It seemed like Joe Burrow would not play, but Burrow was announced in. So the total, I think, closed at 45 and a half. It still hit the under uh, at uh, 35 points. So good call for Ryan. Two and one in the traditional markets for those two games. As far as props go, he had Dallas Goddard, Kate Otten, and Jamar Chase for anytime touchdowns. Those guys did not score for their respective teams. Yardage bets were Chris Godwin over 54 and a half and Devontae Smith to have a longest reception of over 23 and a half yards. Godwin, 32 yards. They just kind of ran the ball too much, never had the ball. A.J. Brown got all the downfield work for the Eagles, so no over for Devontae Smith. Ryan, though, did hit on Baker Mayfield throw a pick. That was minus 130. And of course, that one did cash uh, for Ryan there. In the NFL, I've finished one and three this past week. I had the Bucks plus five and a half. It was a week where I got a lot of good closing line value, but uh, pretty bad results. Uh, of course, the Bucks closed at, I think it was four and a half on Monday morning. I think it got back to five and a half later on in the day. So no closing line value there, but did get it elsewhere. And the Bucks just didn't play well, you know, uh, and the Eagles did. So you could expect that based on the fact the Eagles went to the Super Bowl last year. But a uh, miss from me there. I missed on the Falcons, Lions over 45 and a half. That one closed up a point at 46 and a half. But the Lions defense came to play, finished with just 26 points and uh, missed there. I had the Raiders money line on Sunday night. Great movement there. I got it at minus 106 and it closed, I think, in the minus 150s. So awesome movement. But the Steelers offense came to play. Um, I would not blame Josh McDaniels for this one. Uh, they shouldn't have been down 16 to begin with. So the fact that he decided to kick a field goal, that's not the reason they lost. So good CLV on both uh, the Lions Falcons over and the Raiders money line, but no wins there. A bit of CLV on the Chiefs Bears over 47 and a half. That closed to 48 and a half. And that one went it finished at 51. Uh, Chiefs put up 41 by themselves. Bears put up 10. So that was a win there, but frustrating week to get good movement and have bad results. That can happen for sure. So not sweating it too much given that the market was on my side, but definitely frustrating to feel good about bets during the week and have them not cash uh, at the end of the day. Things went better on the NASCAR side of things. Did hit a top 10 bet on the Cup Series side. That was Daniel Suarez, a plus 230. I didn't think he'd make it, but there was a bunch of chaos towards the end of that race, and Suarez took advantage, finished eighth. I also did, did it the winner, William Byron, in the Sunday update for the betting guide. So 
Again, I'd recommend checking out FanDuel.com slash research for updated betting guides throughout the week as more markets are posted uh, and as uh, we get qualifying and practice results too. For Byron specifically, it was because he lengthened post-practice and qualifying. Didn't know the fastest car by any means, but he did, did win that race. Uh, losses for me were Martin Truex Jr. plus 900 to win and Austin Cindric top 10 at 8-1. to one. On the Xfinity Series side of things, I mentioned I had value on John Hunter Nemechek plus 240 to win. Other outrights were Chandler Smith at plus 2,500 and Riley Herbst plus 3,500. Uh, Herbst direct right away, so that didn't hit. Uh, but Smith finished fourth, ran really well there, and Nemechek won. So uh, got the hit at plus 240 there. Mentioned there was a plus 275 out there for Nemechek as well. So good week in NASCAR for me. Felt pretty good about that. And um, been a good year overall on the NASCAR side of things. Hopefully hopefully some of that luck translates to the NFL side as well. We can start uh, hitting on that in the near future. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Tomorrow, we are back once again talking some college football with Dr. Ed Feng. You can find that on the Covering the Spread podcast feed on the FanDuel YouTube page and over on FanDuel TV+. Plus. Big thank you once again to Ryan Williams. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Back with us next week on Monday and Tuesday to talk Monday Night Football and futures following this upcoming week. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across the next couple of days. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow afternoon to preview week number five in college football. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 